So I'm Nelly Benayoun. I'm an experienced designer and director based in the UK, in London. And I've been doing for the past years this uh, sort of project which involves a big range of uh, physicists and space scientists into this really surreal uh, experience like uh, the International Space Orchestra, which is being presented now at uh, Z33 until May. So the International Space Orchestra is basically a musical community that I assembled uh, over the summer 2012 in NASA Ames Research Center, which is based in California. And just to tell you a bit more about the actual center, it's quite, uh, it's quite an avant-garde center, you know, they, they have developed like a lot of uh, very cutting-edge missions such as the one-way mission to Mars. They are developing a whole synthetic biology program. You know, they have been developing L-Cross. The L-Cross mission we actually found that there used to be some uh, water on the moon. So, you know, they are quite, um, yeah, they are quite open-minded in the way they deal with science and the, the way they deal with like their own mission as well. I contacted them to kind of like get a sense of who these people are, who are the people between uh, behind all uh, all this incredible you know uh, scientific mission that NASA has been developing for the past years, and I kind of found that uh, music in a way something that make them more close to us. Uh, so that's how you know it sort of started. That's the way I I, uh, I I told them about the project, and then after that it became pretty much about. Um, the reenactment of uh, the Apollo 11 mission. So Apollo 11 is a famous mission that uh, brought Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin in space. And uh, really what uh, we, I co-wrote a text with the actual NASA flight director called Rusty Hunt on all the elements of this mission that actually went wrong. So everything that went wrong inside mission control during that time is being reenacted inside this film uh, by uh, the actual space scientists from NASA Ames Research Center, from the SETI Institute, Secularity University, and the International Space University. Uh, and they are all like going through all this drama and all this tension that happened during the control room. And that's something that, you know, really I've always been fascinated by, and that's why I choose this operatic form as well. It's like for me, you know, control room sort of like encompass every single uh, intense human emotion. And you know, you, you kind of like don't really think about it, but then when things go wrong in the control room, like for example, a famous control room that went wrong is Chernobyl uh, and the big nuclear explosion that happened there. You know, everything went pretty much, uh, you know, pyroclastic because actually someone just, one of the, one of the young engineers that just pressed the wrong button. And this is where you realize that suddenly all these working dynamics uh, sort of like go wrong and you've got this sort of like chaos that happened be between them and all these dynamics just Get, uh, get messed up in a way. And I was really interested in that and I wanted to study this. So what you can see there, it's uh, the layout and the way that uh, everybody and all the space scientists in the International Space Orchestra were positioned during the performance. And that is based on the actual mission control of Apollo 11, but it's also based on you know, what sort of like, uh, you know, speciality they each have. So for example, you know, uh, the, the, head, the deputy director of NASA wasn't playing the role of like, the actual NASA representant inside the mission control. He was playing another role, and his role was being played by someone else, uh, like John Cumbers, for example, who is actually in charge of a scientific biology program. And that was really interesting because then suddenly, you know, when we were doing the project and when we were rehearsing and everything, they would basically start to get to know each other as well because, of course, he will want to play and to perform like him. Therefore, he will tell him some information about it. And so, you sort of like, in a way, this, this for me is really the design element of the project. Is the way, you know, I cast them and I put them together is really what sort of like like makes the dynamics and the working dynamic different inside NASA and Research Center, but also as part of the orchestra. Uh, so, you know, I mean, what I should say as well is like this is not only, not only there is this control room in a way, and like in, the, in every single control room there is what is happening there, and then there is another control room. So in a way, that's one side of things. That's all the space scientists performing, but there is all, you know, all the key collaborators of the project because we had, you know, like fantastic collaborators on this. Uh, so we had, you know, Damon Albon, uh, the frontman of Blur and Gorillaz, Bobby Womack, uh, and both of them, you know, they released an album called The Bravest Men of the Universe. And basically, you know, while we were doing the project, Neil Armstrong passed away. 
And so we thought that that was going to be a really lovely piece to integrate to our program. So then basically they came, I mean, you know, we, we recorded the music together and so on. So then we had them. Then Piguin Cafe with um, a fantastic, you know, jazz band uh, in, uh, in based in London actually wrote a piece of music called The War Signal, uh, which is based on uh, a signal that the City Institute received from space and until now has been thought as being a signal from, you know, extraterrestrial life. Uh, and so, you know, he, it's all lived from the control room. So, you know, one of the engineers was working there, sort of like receive a signal which was called, uh, I think it was 1420 hertz. And that's what the music is based on. Like, you know, they are all singing 142205 and so on. Uh, then you had Mawadenki with a Japanese composer who wrote them a piece of music in Japanese. So that was quite unusual, you know, talking about the surreality of the project. Yeah. Then Bruce Serling and Jasmina Tezanovich. So Bruce Serling uh, with a really famous scientific, uh, science fiction author uh, who invented the cyberpunk movement with William Gibson who actually wrote a piece of music uh, uh, called the Kepler Aria, and the Kepler mission, which is a mission which, uh, which aimed to find habitable planets. And all of this has been, you know, uh, put together by a fantastic musical director called Evan Price, who is a two-time Grammy Award jazz man, and actually train each of them so that they can be at their very best. Because you can understand, of course, that there is massive challenge with this. It's like they are really busy people, and all of them, you know, uh, participate to the project on a voluntary basis. So, you know, so we, we had to kind of like uh, get them to the very best in a very short amount of time. We only did it in two months. Obviously, you know, we were the International Space Orchestra and we are still, you know, it's like it's a laboratory for, you know, experiment, you know, so it's still existing in NASA M Research Center. But of course, you know, every time we will do a performance and every time we will, you know, do a project together, it seems that it will be a normal request to actually have uh, patches. And we all know that NASA is quite famous uh, from, for all these patches. So it, it sort of like came, came about that there was a request from the project. And so I, I asked uh, a fantastic graphic designer called David Benke to actually do us uh, the logo and the, the main patches of the International Space Orchestra, as you can see there. And then here is uh, Timothy Gagnon, who is actually a graphic designer working for NASA and actually had done like many NASA mission patches, who, uh, you know, agreed to collaborate on the project and did us this fantastic, you know, gift in like doing us, you know, this unique uh, patches there for our first, uh, our first performance. And so, you know, he will do the patches usually of actual astronauts who are going in space, you know, on the International Space Station. So it was quite unusual to like have, you know, wear this while we were performing in front of the, the wind tunnel. So while I was there, you know, like I told you, uh, we had actually an astronaut as part of the International Space Orchestra called Yvonne Gago. And, uh, you know, and she has been such an inspiration for me while, I, you know, while we were doing the project. And so, you know, I always really been fascinated by space. And so they all started to tell me that actually I should probably train and become an astronaut. And so, you know, little by little, I started to grow this idea and thought, well, actually, why not, in a way? You know, since my whole job is about like, giving an experience uh, to all of us on things that we cannot access, and why, why would I not be an astronaut myself? So I'm actually, you know, that's something that I'm quite proud of. Like, basically, they made me this recommendation later as part of the project, which basically say that they recommend me to the Astronaut Corp. So you've got a letter by uh, John Boyd, who is a senior advisor of the Center Director of NASA Ames Research Center, a letter from the chief scientist of NASA Ames Research Center, saying that basically, yes, I could become an astronaut because I've been working hours and hours and months and months, and I can speak five languages and so on. But then the main problem is that I we need to marry a US citizen and he's sort of like wondering whether or not that's a good thing. Uh, and then you've got uh, another letter from Annette Rodriguez, who was one of the first uh, astronaut trainer in NASA Ames Research Center. And she's basically saying that because I'm speaking this five language and anyway, you know, the aim, you know, the project and the music they recorded aim to be broadcasted into space. She's saying, well, you know, she should surely go there. So now I'm like basically, you know, doing this whole PhD in geography and like getting trained and so on. And then hopefully, hopefully, if I manage to get my pilot lessons, then in the next five or eight years, maybe we will go in space. The International Space Orchestra eventually became uh, a feature documentary. 
So, you know, everything and, you know, how we put this whole project together has been uh, put together inside this film there, which is presented as well inside the exhibition. And um, what is, you know, what is quite interesting, you know, I was telling you as well about all these collaborators who came on board. Uh, and we had basically Skywalker, who is, you know, George Lucas' ranch was actually recorded Star Wars. We invited us to record all our program there. So, you know, inside this film, you've got all this moment being captured. And I think it's quite interesting for me how suddenly the sort of the same graal of fiction and, you know, Star Wars, and we all know what it is, sort of like meets with a really, you know, tangibility or tangible side of uh, NASA. So, you know, he will capture that and he, he captures as well, of course, you know, all the collaborators. So here you can see his Bruce Sterling, the science fiction, also speaking about the Kepler area, the music that he has been. Uh, uh, writing, so you, you get you know a bit more of a sense of how we made uh, we made this and who are the people behind it. This is uh, the 27 minutes uh, music video of the performance that the International Space Orchestra did on the 6th of September 2012 in front of the world largest uh, wind tunnel. Uh, so you can see all of them, all this like hard uh, hard work that they did, you know, like because they are all volunteers, so they really had to take uh, the time, you know, in the evening and rehearse, 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 rehearse. And actually all of this hard work actually pay off by getting them to, you know, perform there. And I mean, you know, you, if you get a chance to come in the exhibitions and you can hear, but they actually sound really good. So yes, yeah, so I think maybe I should stop there and uh, yeah, maybe just say that the International Space Orchestra is still existing at Nazarene Research Center and that we will be developing more projects in the future.